All right, fabulous. So I'm so excited that we have Patricia here today. She is a certified applied animal behaviorist. She has a PhD, very exciting, in animal stuff, no less. Um, <laughs> she's, she's, she's known worldwide as an expert on dog and cat behavior. She has 13 books. She's presented all over the United States and uh, Europe as well, North America and Europe, I should say. She's a behaviorist for Bark Magazine. She is a consulting editor for the Journal of Comparative Psychology and so many other things I don't even have time to tell you. And she's one of my personal heroes because she's not only an expert on dog behavior, but she has a fabulous speaking style. And I will leave that to her. Good morning. Hi. It is so fun to be with a bunch of people who are as stupid in love with their dogs as I am. <laughs> That's my goal in life, is to have one foot in good science and knowledge and another foot in poop. <laughs> Pretty much, maybe not literally, but, but, but you get the idea. You know, I like practical. I like theory, I love theory, but I also like practical. So that's what I try and do, is I try and combine those things um, such that you can take information, maybe learn a little bit, maybe, maybe not, maybe have something you knew before but now you know it in a whole different way. Does that happen to you? You go to seminars, you go like, I knew that, but I feel better about it now. You know, you get supported. So, um, so we're going to talk about two different topics, two very different topics in some ways today. The morning is all about dog-dog reactivity. We get to reinforce ourselves in the afternoon by talking about play. So let's just start right off by talking about dog-dog reactivity. I'm going to focus mostly on dogs who are on leash. This morning, I'm talking about the kind of dog, we all know them, we've all, some of us have had them, who you're out walking, you're at the vet clinic, you're at the park, you're at dog training, you're in your neighborhood, your dog sees another dog, and either it's bar -ar 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 -ar, or it's some version thereof, or sort of working its way up to. It's the dog who makes walking not fun, the dog who humiliates you, <laughs> right? You know, um, and, and ironically, it's, I think, becoming increasingly common. How many of you have traveled outside of the country where their dog's off leash a lot? How much dog-dog reactivity do you see? Almost none, right? It's our fault. <laughs> we'll never really say it that way. But, but, I mean, it makes intuitive sense. If you put dogs on leashes and, and eliminate their choices, about how to behave, where to be, and how to interact with another dog. First of all, you've increased tension. So you've increased this, that you know, a dog has, has um, some desire to behave in a particular way. It can't do that because it's trapped, in a way, on this leash. And so they can't greet dogs the way they would normally greet other dogs. Added onto that, inadvertently, because we are primates, we have created the dog greeting scenario from hell. It's called a sidewalk, yep. right? And, and we love sidewalks because they, 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 you know, we're not walking in the mud, we don't have to pick our skirts up anymore, right? We, you know, we're, we're walking on this nice surface, it tells us where to walk, it delineates things, and we're primates, and the way we greet other people is face to face. So I say, hi, how are you? I'm so glad that I can't reach very far, but you know, it's like, hi, how are you doing? And so this is a really friendly thing to do, right? What would you think of somebody who, when you saw them, so you make contact with them and, and they go, <laughs> and they arc around, and they look at the ground, Oh, and they will not make eye contact. And then they finally come up and sniff your butt. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the way dogs greet is the exact opposite of the way humans greet. And so we are very comfortable with this face-to-face, -face, hi, how are you? It's the worst thing you can do to a dog, right? And so we've created that with sidewalks and face-to-face -face approaches and leashes. So we put them in an uncomfortable position inadvertently and then we force them into an increasingly uncomfortable position. And so, not too surprisingly, um, we get some problems with that. 
In a way, ironically, I think it's a side effect of a great thing because one, we're getting our dogs out more. That's wonderful. You know, when I first started, there was no agility class. <laughs> there, there, it, it did not exist. Um, oh, when I first started, oh, dear, we won't even go there. But, but <laughs> nobody put their dogs on leash where I lived. Um, you open the door and let them out. You know, and, and there was no, there was an occasional dog fight, but it was very occasional. Basically, the dogs left the house, they picked up their friend. I, my dog Fudge would leave the house, pick up the rough coated collie named Chief. Chief and Fudge would go pick up the boxer cross named something, and they'd spend all day together outside. It was their doggy daycare center, was the neighborhood. You know, um, and they'd take a, they'd meet us at the bus, and they'd not go over garbage, and they'd, you know, get into trouble, and sometimes they'd die right? Um, they get hit by the bus. So I'm not advocating that we get back to that. But nonetheless, one, dogs are unleashed more. Two, we're doing more with them, which is great. It's great. You know, we're going to agility. We're taking to the vet more. That's all wonderful stuff. So that's really good. And the other good thing is that I think our expectations are higher now. There's a sense now that, that, that you can fix things, that you don't have to put up with dogs will be dogs. Um, it, we, we were much less inclined to try and intervene if there was a dog fight or if somebody behaved badly than we are now. So, so again, that's, that's a sign of, of a good thing. So mostly I'm going to talk about dogs, dog, dog, dog interactions and reactivity on leash, but that doesn't mean that you can't use this for other kinds of scenarios. You can use a lot of the same methods for dogs who get over aroused when they see a bicyclist or, um, you know, heaven forbid, a skateboarder, <laughs> or, or a passing car, or they're uncomfortable with people. So these are methods that you can generalize a lot, but I want to focus today specifically on dog-dog reactivity on leash, partly because we just have a morning. And so one of the things I should warn you about is you will be frustrated. <laughs> just, just. If, there is no way you're going to get all your questions answered in a half a day about this issue. It's just, it's not possible. And that's partly because what I've chosen to do is, what, what I'm going to do with this limited time that I have, is I'm going to give you my best summary of all the different methods out there. So it means you're not going to get a really great detailed explanation of, um, of one particular method, which is a wonderful thing to do. How many people were here yesterday for Grisha's bat training. It was great, wasn't it? It was great. Those of you who were not here, you really missed the good stuff. I, you're just sorry. <laughs> it, was, it was really good. And even when she had a whole day to talk about one method, didn't some of you feel like, but wait, but, but, I, but, but wait, I want more details, right? Um, so, so you're just going to get a summary. Um, and hopefully that still will be very, very helpful when you think about what should I do with this particular dog? What should I do with my dog? What should I do with my client's dog? I know about half of you probably are trainers. My belief, and this is very much a personal opinion, it's not data, it's not science, my belief is that the bigger your toolbox, the better you are. That's a, I, that's a Terry Ryan phrase. I love that phrase. Um, the, the, the more tools you have, the more you can customize treatment to not just the dog, but also to the person. So if it's just you and your dog, you might be thinking like, well, what could I do best? What would be easiest for me? What would work best for me in my context with my dog? OK. Let me, let me um, say one thing about, by way of introduction, about reactive versus aggressive. Because those are very easily confounded terms. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because they're related to each other. So, Years ago, I used to talk all the time about dog-dog aggression. I talk more about dog-dog reactivity. I was talking to a colleague of mine. She was like, oh, reactive. Oh, I'm so sick of that word. And, and I said, I know, I know. But I think it's a better word than aggression. Because we all know dogs who are barking and lunging may not necessarily be being aggressive, right? The biological definition of aggression is very specific. It's, it's a behavior with the intent to cause harm, which I find very interesting, by the way, because biologists are always trying not to make mental attributions. 
But somehow that one just slid right through. I love that. It's like nobody's noticed. It's like the emperor has no clothes. But that is the biological definition of some kind of a behavior with the intent to cause harm. So predation, strictly speaking, is not considered aggression. Um, a dog who defensively goes la, 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 to defend itself, that is defensive behavior that is not, also not considered aggression. To the general public, anything that has teeth showing, right, is pretty much aggression. So it is helpful to, to remember there are two different, different, different definitions of that. Um, and so if you're defining aggression uh, strictly, then, then that's a subset of reactivity. And you might also want to think about the term reactivity. Well, what is that? Everything reacts. You know, the only thing that doesn't react is a rock falling off of a wagon. I mean, when you're looking, when you first study behavior, the first thing you do is like, well, what's behavior? Well, well we all know that. Except then when you start thinking about defining it, it's like, ooh, it actually gets a little bit more complicated. So any reaction is, any, you know, all behavior is a reaction, right? So, what's a, so if a dog reacts, if a dog sees another dog and goes like, that's being reactive. So really what we mean, it's overreactive, right? Or it's problematically reactive. Or, or really what it means is we don't like the reaction, <laughs> right? Suzanne Clothier talks about, about appropriate and inappropriate. She's like, it's appropriate to the dog, right? So when I say reactive, you know, parenthetically, I mean overreactive. Dogs who are problematic in some way. So a dog can be reactive and not aggressive, but they can't be aggressive and not reactive. So just keep that in mind. Um, so one, one, actually one last point about being reactive and aggressive is that those terms are very related in one sense. In that, th th this, this is an illustration of the saying that's very popular in the Midwest, which is I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. <laughs> I don't know if you use that here. But we all know what happens at sports events. People get emotionally aroused. An emotional arousal is driven out of some very interesting parts of your brain. It's separate from your limbic system. So you can be very fearful, but not highly aroused. You can be um, angry, but not highly aroused. High arousal is mediated by all kinds of areas of your brain, the insula, the reticular formation system. And so what, what happens with arousal is as an individual becomes more and more emotionally aroused, a lot of inhibitions fall away. And one of the things that happens is you can, individuals can just fall once they become aroused enough. They, they, it, it's like all the inhibitions against aggression fall away and they just slide into aggression. And it, it makes no sense except we all know what happens all the time. I mean, look at fans at a sports event. They're screaming, kill the umpire, then they start fighting. I went, I went to a hockey game once and I'll never go again. The guys behind me started fighting. They really, it was like, this is like the saying. It's like they're fighting and they were punching each other and there was beer on my head and it was like, <laughs> I was like, this is not fun for me. You know, I deal with aggression all day long. I don't need this. Um, so, you know, it happens. And so one of the things that's really important for us to think about, dogs on leash, they, have, they can't disperse this tension. Well, what's a good way to disperse tension? Right? Um, I had a, I had, I've had some lessons with the man I used to call the Tiger Woods of herding dogs, but I don't anymore, because <laughs> his wife would kill me. <laughs> but Alistair McRae is literally, I mean, like, I kiss the hem of the man's pants. I mean, he's brilliant. He's a brilliant herding dog trainer. And when my, the border collie I have now, Willie, started a really bad habit, he was afraid of the sheep. And what he'd do is they were behind a fence, and he'd come up to the fence, and he'd get up to it, and he'd go, and the sheep would all go like that. And you could just see Willie be reinforced two ways. One, oh, I feel better. I was like, oh, there's a sheep, oh, there's a sheep, oh, they're looking at me. Oh, I feel better. But he also got reinforced because the sheep went, Wah! and he went, cool. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. I'm so cool. And so Alistair saw that, and, and he said, you can't ever let that happen, ever again. You have to do everything you can to stop it from happening. Because 
there is nothing more reinforcing. You cannot create a better reinforcement than that feeling he's going to get when he's tense and he explodes. So keep that in mind, by the way, when we talk later about different methods um, and keeping dogs under and um, sort of over a threshold, because that's had a big impact on the way I work with dogs. So I want to move along by showing you some videos. Some of them are pretty old. They're not the best quality. But I want to show you some videos of a whole range of reactivity. Okay. So this is, I'll just give you a little introduction here. You're going to see a little, a little arrow. There it is. You're going to see a um, border collie. Uh, she looks like a Aussie, but she's a border collie named Sage. She was a rescue dog. Uh, she was great as a foster dog in a pack of dogs. Now she lives as a single dog. And by the way, that is very often a cause of behavioral changes. It happens a lot to fosters. He's great here. Yeah, he lives with six dogs. You send him off to go live as the only dog, and all of a sudden his behavior is completely different. No, it's not the fault of the new owner. So Sage is now a single dog and has, has developed a very serious dog-dog aggression problem. You're not going to see it here, thank heavens. Um, basically, before this point, what Sage did is Sage would, uh, happened twice, Sage would silently run at another dog at a dead run, bite it, and hold on. There was no barking. There was no lunging. It was just bloody. So there's a dog behind, obviously. And, and you can see very, very well, I think, when Sage sees the dog. I call that the lock and load. All right, lock and load. No barking, no lunging. But I would call this a reactivity problem. And this is a kind of, this is some of the most serious kind of reactivity problem and that I think we all know, let me just um, stop that for a second. I think a lot of us know that dogs who are absolutely silent um, before they go after another dog, that is the most serious kind. That is true aggression. Dogs who are bar, 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 that's a lot about signaling, it's a lot about emotional arousal, um, it's a lot about communicating and negotiating, a silent, silent, approach is, is like deadly silent runner. It's like, I'm not negotiating with you. I'm not communicating with you. I'm not trying to tell you to go away. I'm just trying to get you. Just trying to get you. Now, that's very different than Makara here. Makara, sort of a more classic reactive dog, she's actually watching Sage. Now, we just sort of flip the camera. We have a second session now. Um, just a few minutes later, she's watching Sage approach her. And watch her body language. Oh, she, no, she has. I don't think she's even, I'm not even sure she's seen it yet. So, yeah, yeah, it, it might have looked like she was going away from the dog. I don't think she was. I think the dog was still behind the barn. Let's let this finish, and then I'll answer questions. I should mention this is not the kind of equipment that I would use. I'm well, not a client dog. So she sees Sage now. And so Sage is now interesting. So she just chose to turn away, right? See the tail switch? She chose to turn away, but, but her owner was standing there, mostly because I said, please stand there. <laughs> so, so I could videotape her. Sage is slowly getting closer, and you're going to find the point at which Makara, be there, see it? See it? See the mouth close? And now we're in classic barking lunging. Pilo erected, a whole bunch of ambivalent signals. She's forward, she's back, her ears are forward. Um, so that was a classic set of ambivalence, sort of forward, back. I want to see you. I don't want to see you. My ears are up. So sometimes with dogs like that, people will say, I just, you know, I've, I've looked at all the stuff about reading dogs, and I've studied all the visual changes in their face and, and tail change positions, and, and I've really been working on reading dogs really well, and I'm so confused because I can't figure this dog out. Um, and, and I say, good, good for you, because the dog is confused too. <laughs> so when you get to that point 
of feeling like, you know, I think I can read dogs, or I'm learning to read dogs, and I can't figure this dog out, because, you know, on the one hand there's this, and on the other hand there's that. His ears are forward, he's moving forward, but his commissure is pulled back. That's an ambivalent dog. And that's often the dogs who have the most trouble with this reactivity. So trust yourself. Don't feel like I'm crazy. It's like, oh no, it's the dog is as confused as I am. I am seeing a bunch of contradictory signals. So this is Thess. Thess uh, was a dog in Dog's Best Friend Puppy and Puppy 2 classes. He's an adolescent standard. And what you're going to see is Thess is, um, is looking to the side where my dog Luke is going to appear from. I don't think you ever actually see Luke. Luke loved to work dog-dog reactivity cases. Luke is off-leash. Luke is sort of behind a building, behind a corner. And Luke and Lassie and Pip all did a lot of work with dog-dog reactivity with me. And all of them were, they were 110% reliable. So I would work them off-leash in a lot of context. I got, I got criticized, by the way, just recently. Somebody said, you cannot say 110%. <laughs> there is no such thing. And you're doing a dis... I'm, we went on. You are doing a disservice. <laughs> I was like, oh, honey. Oh, worry about something else. <laughs> no. It's like... It's sort of a literary illusion. <laughs> you know? So trying to say these dogs are really, really, really reliable. So Luke was off leash. And what I would do is I would stop him. I could move him right or left. I could back him up. I could bring him forward. So I called Luke to me, and what, you don't, what you're not going to see is, in spite of this relatively moderate reaction from Fess, this is Luke, Fess is over here, and Luke is like, ah, da, da. and he does this huge arc, there was plenty of room between them, and he does this huge arc, like, ooh, um, so here's what Luke was looking at. I don't think there's any sound here. It doesn't look that bad, right? So we switched a little bit. Ooh. OK. So this next scenario, I put Luke in the car. Luke basically, literally, for the first time in his life, said, I don't want to work with that dog. He did. He literally he turned away and was like, I'm going to honor that. You're fine. So I got Lassie out. <laughs> but, but I put her on a leash. I gave her more room. Um, and what you're going to see is Lassie passing by. And I always ask the owner on a 0 to 10, 10 being the worst, the most extreme, 0 being the best, what level of intensity are we, uh, is the behavior that we're seeing right now? And she said this was a three. This was a three. Whoops. So the, the one thing I was going to tell you about this dog, and then I just have to move on, is that when I worked with this, I hadn't done a consult on this dog yet. When I worked with this dog, its coat was extremely poor. And it's, this is one of these very intuitive things. Exactly physically, what was it about this dog that made me say, this is like a blink moment, you know? What was it about this dog that made me say something's physically really wrong with this dog? Because he'd had a vet check. All the numbers were fine. The vet said the dog's fine. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm not a veterinarian. I'm, I don't do medicine. But I have to tell you, I looked at this dog and I'm like, something's really wrong with this dog. Physiologically, physically, something looks wrong with this dog. It was partly coat. His eyes looked strange. His face looked really tense. Went to a Chinese medicine practitioner. It was a different dog in three months changed the diet, went on some Chinese herbs, went on some homeopathic herbs, was a very, very different dog. Um, still had behavioral problems, but literally became a different dog. I think both of my dogs basically evaluated this dog as, what's the, what's the dog word for crazy? 
what's the scientific term? I mean, I don't know what was wrong with this dog, but it was, not, it was unpredictable. You know, I think that's what it was. It was absolutely unpredictable and it was highly aroused. And so both of my dogs were like, whoa, something's wrong here. <coughs> had been well socialized, had never been Good. hurt as far as you know. Here's Eli. Eli was in um, one of our fight, was just started one of our feisty Fido classes. Eli, this one! Lunge, no bark, but lunge. Very typical for a boxer. I'm asked me a great question yesterday about irony. Do dogs get irony? Well, I don't know, but dogs ever do. This one, this one does. <laughs> okay. This isn't a shelter. This is a pit you're going to see who was from a fighting background, um, and you're going to see a very different kind of reactivity. Basically, uh, he, she, I don't even remember, is going to be walked up and down. Are you a dog? Hello. Oh, let's play. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Dogs, dogs, dogs everywhere. Now, look at the white dog who's kenneled. You're going to see it in a minute. Look at that. Direct eye contact. Oh, did you want to fight? So, in a way, that was not aggression. That was like, oh, let's fight! <laughs> Okie dokie! summarize a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of, I'm, I'm going to summarize the treatment methodologies that I use the most, that are the most well known, that are the most out there. I'm not going to do any of them justice, but, but what I'm hoping to do is give you a really good idea of when, when, which one might be most useful, um, what some of the benefits are, what some of the problems are, um, and basically pretty much how they work. So let's start with classical counter conditioning, and then I'm going, and, and I'm going to spend very little time on that, but I'm also going to talk about, we're going to demonstrate operant counter conditioning using positive reinforcement. Operant counter conditioning using positive reinforcement. And so we'll, we'll demonstrate with some dogs, we're going to demonstrate auto watch, we're going to demonstrate where's the dog. Before I get into all of those methods, there are a couple things I want to say about them in general that are, that apply to every one of them to different degrees. And one is that if you do an overview of them, which I've just done relatively lately in, that, in the last couple of months, if you do an overview of all these different methods, which, which at first blush, some of them seem exactly opposite of each other. You know, teach the dog to look away from the dog, teach the dog to look at a dog. Um, don't teach the dog anything, let the dog teach itself. I mean, they seem so different, but I was looking at them and I had one of those moments that's like the Gary Larson cartoon where, where, the gra where the cows are eating grass, they're all grazing away, and all of a sudden one cow jerks her head up like this and goes, this is grass. <laughs> We've been eating grass. <laughs> so so my, my, my cow-like aha moment was, we're all doing the same thing. In a, in a functional way, in that most of these methods, all of these methods, the ones that I use the most and the ones that are sort of hot right now, all of the methods in some way decrease the confrontation between two dogs. They, they basically start with two dogs like this, 
with the potential of two dogs like this. And then, and then they diffuse that. In some way, you, increase, you, you decrease that confrontation, you increase the distance between the dogs, and the dog is reinforced for what we would consider to be an appropriate behavior. So in one way, they all do the same thing. In another way, of course, God is in the details, and so in another way, they're very, very different, and so which one you choose depends on many, many, many factors. Another, another part of all of these methods that in my belief system is critical is understanding thresholds. And what I mean by thresholds is simply the, the minimum the minimum amount of a trigger or a stimulus that elicits the beginning of the problem behavior. Now, some people define thresholds differently, and we'll talk about that with those different methods. Um, CAT, CAT talks about taking a dog up to the boundary, but, um, but then we'll, take, we'll, we'll, we'll start a dog barking and lunging. Um, whereas I like to work sub-threshold, that works sub-threshold. Um, so, so it's sort of exactly where you, you, what you do with that line varies depending on the method, but every method requires that you know that particular dog and that particular dog's minimum sort of amount intensity, I call it, the intensity of a trigger to elicit the beginning, in my estimation, of the problematic behavior. And that requires being able to read dogs. So obviously I can't do that this morning because a really good dog reading session would take the weekend, if not the next three years, right? But the better, every one of us can get better at it. There is nobody I know who is so good at reading dogs that they couldn't get a tiny bit better, right? So wherever you are, just try and get a little bit better. The obvious ones, the, the ones that we first learn that the general public doesn't know is the body stiff versus, versus the body loose. That's one of the first things you see. You know, you get a dog who's loosey-goosey and all of a sudden the body goes stiff. You saw it in Makara, I mean, look at all the dogs you saw it on. You almost always see it right before you get something else. Um, the mouth open or closed, that's a huge key to me. Look at, look at the picture on the bottom here. These are, that was, those, were the, those were the dogs that I had for oh, 13 years. Um, that's Lassie and Luke and Pip and Tulip. Which dog has never been in the training center before where that picture was taken? <laughs> right? And um, I actually, you, you would think this is patently obvious. It's very not obvious. It is very not obvious. Uh, I actually had a professional photographer come take pictures of Tulip, and he had one of those cameras with a lens like the biggest, blackest eye you've ever seen, like the worst confrontational trigger you could imagine. She wasn't reactive particularly, but she did not want to look at it. So there's one picture when he sort of first got it out, she hadn't really looked at it, where she's like, <sighs> and 78 pictures after that, our, our Tulip going, <laughs> They chose this. <laughs> and, I, and, and it hadn't been published yet. And I said, you know, it was an ad for the magazine, a full page ad for Wisconsin Trails. And I said, do you know, people who know dogs will know that she's a little uncomfortable in that picture. Um, is there a reason you didn't pick the picture where she's really happy? And she said, oh, we thought she looked aggressive. <laughs> So it's not always obvious. Um, changes in tail position. Did you see Makara's tail? Go. So, but you have to know the dog, right? I mean, you'll see some dogs in some of my videos whose, whose tail is like this most of the time. So you have to know the dog. You always have to know the dog. Um, direct stare versus look away. Blinking, by the way. I'm really interested in your take on blinking. I, I have heard it argued that blinking is a sign of relaxation, and I've heard it argued um, that blinking is a sign of anxiety. I have heard these things argued by people who I have, have tremendous faith in, <laughs> all of them, just different ones. I think I've sorted it out, but you tell me what you think. Here's what, I th here's what I think, and I'm curious what you guys think. 
if, if a dog is, is looking relatively relaxed and then, and then starts blinking a lot, I take that as a sign of anxiety. On the other hand, if a dog is tense and then goes one slow blink, I take that as a sign of relaxation. Does that make sense? Do you agree? So, so blinking, so when you hear blinking, don't just think blinking, right? Because it's blinking, what kind of blinking, and in what context. Uh, horizontal versus vertical changes. Oh, I'm going to stand up and look really tall. I'm going to shrink down. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to move back. Those are obviously very important. Um, yawns, lookaways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Lookaways are like are like blinks in that they can mean a lot of things. They're like human smiles and tail wags. We all know tail wags do not mean friendliness necessarily. Um, uh, smiles are the same way, right? You know, I call it the. Oh, what a nice dress. <laughs> right? You know, the reason bitch is a dirty word, right? Um, so lookaways are the same way. Lookaways can be like, I am going to have nothing to do with you. Or they can be, ooh. And if they could do it with their paws, I think they'd do this, you know? <laughs> That's, that's the human equivalent of whale eye, by the way. It's like, mm, mm. Um, so lookaways can mean a lot of different things too. Again, you've got to know the dog. So, given that, let's let's talk about two treatment methods: classical counterconditioning and operant conditioning, positive reinforcement operant conditioning, teaching an incompatible behavior. I'm going to talk about them a little bit, and then we're going to do. We're going to work two dogs um, using those methods. So classical counterconditioning is the simplest in one way. And I actually, I didn't mean them to be in this order, but they, the, the treatment methodologies I'm going to go through, they tend to be in an order of least amount of knowledge about dog behavior and reading dogs to, to and this is just my opinion, most amount of knowledge of dog behavior and reading dogs. And that's just my opinion. We can talk about that in a little bit. I didn't actually mean to uh, order them in that way. But classical counterconditioning, you know about classical conditioning, right? You all know the Pavlov story. Um, you may or may not know that actually he wanted the dogs to drool so he could look at chromosomes. And the chromosomes in saliva are extremely large. Anybody take biology 101 and look at chromosomes under the microscope? Um, from your own saliva, right? For some reason, I have no idea why, the chromosomes in saliva are particularly large. Pavlov was a physiologist interested in chromosomes. He had no interest in behavior whatsoever, and he was furious when his dogs kept mucking up his research. Because what happened is he would bring in meat powder um, after he had attached these little saliva catchers. He had, little, he had dogs in little horrible cages, um, and the dog sat there, and he would attach, honest to goodness, these little drool catchers. Some of our dogs could use those. Um, and then he would bring, and then an assistant or somebody would bring in meat that the dog could smell. And we all know that you do not have to teach a dog to salivate when they smell food that they really like, right? It's a, it's a completely, it's called an unconditioned response. You don't need to condition it. You don't need to train it. They just do it. So what happened is the dogs mucked it up because the, the, they, they became classically conditioned to associating the sound of the door opening, the bell on the door, other sounds in the laboratories, meaning that if you hear, let's just take the bell. It didn't start with the bell, but we all know the bell story. If you hear a bell, then you're going to get meat. So what happened is when they heard the bell, they began to salivate. Well, the meat, you know, the little things weren't attached yet. So he was crazed with frustration. But he was smart enough to get, oh, wait, this is huge. This is really interesting. The dogs are acting like the bell is meat itself. So he ended up, he wrote over 500 research articles on this topic. He completely changed his research interests because, because it wasn't just that the dogs made this learned association. It was, it was as if the bell became the meat. Their internal physiological and emotional reaction was, 
was the same for the bell as it was for the meat. It's a very, very strong, strong response. And when you can create it, it's very, very powerful. Ironically, all the methods we're talking about are actually going to help create it, but sometimes indirectly. So the bottom line simply is that with, in this case, with classical counter conditioning, counter because you already have a reaction to an unfamiliar dog, you want to counter that with a different reaction. So, in, so classical counter conditioning, it's the easiest training in the world in one way. Um, basically, you have a dog, we'll illustrate a little bit when the demo dogs come up, but, but you have a dog, uh, it sees another, uh, uh, it sees another dog, and you take food, and you throw it on the ground. So, so all your owner needs to know is, is to look for another dog, and as soon as another dog appears, you stop, and you throw food on the ground, and your dog eats it. With the idea being that your dog becomes classically conditioned to respond to seeing another dog with the way he or she feels when he eats food on the ground. So basically, to me, the mental process is chicken, 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 I love chicken. Chicken, 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 I love chicken, I love chicken. Every time I see a dog, I get chicken. I love dog, chicken, dog, dog, chicken, dog, chicken, dog, chicken, dog, chicken, dog, chicken, dog, chicken. I love dogs. I love other dogs. So, so the training is literally throwing food on the ground or dropping food on the ground or playing. We're going to talk about what kind of reinforcement a little bit later or play. Play is always better, in my opinion, if you, can, if you have a dog who loves it. You can eat food when you're nervous, but you can't play when you're nervous if you're a dog. If you're a cat, you can, but if you're a dog, you can't. Um, but, but, so it's easy in one sense, but it has some problems with it. One of the problems, one of, to me, the biggest problem is how do you really know what the dog is associating? So you have a human and a dog walking up, and the dog looks up, and they go, look at the person, look at the shoes. Look, every time somebody with a hat and a jacket comes up, you know, I get food. It's harder to know exactly what the conditioned association is. Um, so, so it has definite limitations. I use this on occasion sometimes when I have dogs who are really, really, really problematic and love food, absolutely, and an owner who I think is not interested in training, is not interested in reading her dog, um, but basically seems like a good candidate for that. And we will use it just to get them started. I never end on this. I, my experience is this is never enough, but sometimes it's a good start. So let's look at operant positive reinforcement, the positive reinforcement quadrat of operant conditioning. And in this kind of operant conditioning, not only are we using positive reinforcement, but in this case, the idea is to teach an incompatible behavior. Your dog is doing something that may be appropriate to your dog, but inappropriate to you. You don't like it when your dog barks and lunges. So you think of something you want your dog to do that keeps him from doing the barking and lunging. What I've done the most of is um, auto watch and where's the dog, which is what we're going to work dogs with. Um, this, this takes an owner who's interested in training. It can be um, uh, pretty easy to teach, though. And one of the things I like about it, as many of the things we're going to talk about, is that it indirectly creates a, a classically conditioned response. Because if, well, I'll just, let me just show you some videos. I'm going to show you some videos, and then we're going to, um, then we're going to bring some dogs up. So again, we're talking about positive reinforcement, auto watch, and where's the dog. Let, let me um, just go over the progression, which is really simple. I'm going to spend very little time on it. But because you can't see the whole progression here when we do the demo dog, the progression is very simple. It's in your notes. Basically, just like you train anything, you don't train any behavior when it's the hardest to learn, right? You train it when it's the easiest to learn. So you first work on teaching a dog watch where there's no distractions, you've got the best reinforcement possible, then you add in some mild distractions of a non-dog related nature, then you add in uh, a dog, but the intent, I always talk about intensity, so the intensity is really low, so the dog is really far away, you used a stuffed dog, 
was a little stuffed dog. I love the stuffed dogs. Oh, I love the stuffed dogs. This is so obedient. So great thing about stuffed dogs, um, and Grisha has some here for sale. If, you tr if you're a trainer and you treat behavioral problems, you've got to have one of these. This is, I learned this from Trish King, who's the first one I know who used it. Um, the great thing about them is, one, it's stuffed. <laughs> and it doesn't move. Um, you can put it anywhere. What's really interesting about it is that it actually tends to set dogs off more than a real dog who's a, who's a big distance away. And, and why would that be? You guys all know the answer. It's stiff. It's not moving. It's staring. It's staring and it's stiff. Mm. So um, I have a video that I haven't digitized. I don't even know where it is. I want to find it. Of three of my dogs meeting a stuffed Rottweiler for the first time. And Pippi, who we called the, the grovel queen, would just, she just groveled her way out, acting exactly like it was a real dog, groveled her way around it. <laughs> and then Luke came out with this big, huge helicopter tail. It's like, oh, look, you're a dog. I'm a dog, too. I love dogs. Hi, 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 hi. Um, Tulip came out like, I'm the guard dog here. <laughs> and then they both were stiff. And then she... <laughs> She kept waiting for something. Um, so it's a very interesting way to evaluate a dog, by the way. Um, and it's great to use them. But remember, this is not the easiest stimulus. If you're talking about starting with low intensity, start with a real dog far away, or this really far away. And never pick up a dog like this, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, honey. Oh, one of, the, one of the things I wanted to be sure to say is that I used to call the, the first method of um, operant conditioning on cue, I used to call it a watch, but the goal is not for you to have to say watch every time your dog sees another dog. That is just not going to get you very far, right? You're always going to be vigilant, you're going to miss the dog, and it's never going to get what I think you want, which is an automatic response when the dog sees another dog, rather than rah, 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 he turns away and goes over here, which has a lot of reinforcement value to it, right? turned away, he's avoided the confrontation, um, and then, and so not only is he, is he avoiding confrontation, he's increasing the distance between him, I'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a minute, um, and then also he gets some kind of, of extra reinforcement, he gets food, he gets play, whatever. Um, okay, so here, let me just tell you a little bit about Oscar. This is Oscar. Oscar... Oscar was uh, adopted from a shelter. The young couple who adopted him took him to a dog training class about, I don't know, a couple nights later. And he seemed very friendly. He was a lovely dog, sort of excitable, but a lovely dog. He came in. Uh, he's, he walked in. There was a little beagle in the class. The beagle came up to him. He sniffed the beagle, and then he grabbed his skull, and he crushed it. Crushed his skull. Just like that. Wonderful owners were devastated. Sweet young couple, absolutely devastated. So the first thing we talked about was this dog will never be around another dog without a muzzle on, period. Are we okay with that? And they were. They totally got it. They did not have unrealistic expectations. They did not expect to take this dog to the dog park. They just wanted to be able to walk down a street without having their dog go crazy. And I, um, I don't have a video of it here, but I have to tell you, when he first saw one of my dogs, he was at my farm, there was probably 70 yards between them. Luke came out, Luke lie down, stay. Oscar became so emotionally aroused that he started hurting himself. He was flipping, he was barking literally hysterically, and I use that term biologically. He was frothing, he was flipping, he became so agitated, I became concerned for his health not to mention his poor owner. So I've never seen, I've never, I've never seen a dog worse than him, ever. I've never seen a dog worse than him. So we taught, we taught him an auto watch using the same progression. It went very slowly. Um, gradually, the dogs got closer and closer. He got to the point eventually where on a leash with one of my dogs, he would sit shoulder to shoulder with them and we were jackpotting auto watches. 
In other words, you could say watch if he turned and he got a treat. But if he, if he anticipated you saying watch, as most dogs will after a couple of repetitions, if he turned and looked at you, then you, he got 15, 10 treats or 15 treats. You guys all use jackpots? So most of you do. Those of you who aren't um, doing a lot of training, if you haven't used a jackpot, it'll change your life. <laughs> You know, I learned that, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, and it was like, why didn't I think of that? You know, so a, a reinforcement is like, here's a really great treat. Here's a great piece of chicken. Here's a great treat for you. They do something that was really hard that you really love. You mark it, and then you go, you are going to Hawaii. You just <laughs> won the contest. And you give them not one handful of treats, but, a, but one treat after another. That seems to have a very different effect there's one treat, it's a big one, blah, 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 blah. I mean, a handful of treats to them is a one reinforcement. It's just a really big one. If you give them 10 in a row, they're like, what did I do, what did I do, this is so cool. Okay, so that, those are the methods in very brief that we use with Gus. This is the first time Gus has ever been off a leash with a dog. He's been conditioned to a muzzle. He's comfortable with the muzzle. Um, he has a wire basket muzzle. Do not use Mickey muzzles in these circumstances. Be sure the muzzle is very, very safe. Be sure it's attached to their collar as well. Condition the dog to the muzzle. Um, so this is, a, whoop. this is the first time. And his owner is very nervous. This is my soulmate dog. This is Luke. Mr. Lukey. Now, Luke loved other dogs. Did he run up to greet Oscar? No, look at the choices these dogs are making. It's so beautiful. Hey, Oscar. We're sniffing the ground. We're going to avoid a direct confrontation. There it is. Whoa. Okay, his owner started crying. This dog, you guys, this dog was so bad. Just getting that out of this dog. Now, it was not like a month. Okay, it took a long time to get this. It took over a year. They lived two hours away, so they didn't come that often. Don't pee on me, Luke. Don't you? <laughs> the, the, the videographer just said, don't pee on me, Luke. He never had. I don't know. I'm not sure why she said that. He must have been looking like he was going to. Look at, look at Oscar's tail. Holy moly, look at that tail. It'd be tiring carrying it like that. Oh, yeah. Really? That's just up. <laughs> That's over up. That's hyper up. That's past vertical. Look at Luke's tail. And look at, every, look at all this sniffing. The dogs are getting choices about how to greet each other. What you'll see here is you'll see her miss some of the auto watches. And you know what? That's OK. That's the great thing about positive reinforcement you know it takes longer to extinguish if it's put on a variable, re uh, variable schedule of reinforcement. Early on, it would be a shame to miss some of these. Hi, sweetie. Oh, oh nice boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, Oscar. Good boy. So as you can see, she wasn't sure. Should I reinforce that or not? It's OK. It doesn't matter. Nice choice Oscar just made there. Good boy. And, and Luke started to greet, and I was like, I don't know if we're ready for that. <laughs> Let Oscar be the approacher. It's always easier for the, for the dog with a problem to be the approacher. I'll talk about that when we do demos. Luke loved this kind of work, but he read dogs so well. Look at the difference in tails. It's just so huge. OK. So uh, let me show you one more video. And this is Luke's nephew, Willie, the dog I have now. Uh, Willie, who came as a puppy, as one of the most pathologically damaged dogs I've seen in 22 years. I took everything I learned in 22 years to keep this dog from being euthanized. Although he was my dog. <laughs> I got him as a puppy. I got him at eight weeks of age. And the first time as a puppy, he smelled the scent, not even the urine. He was at the entranceway to the vet clinic. And he smelled the urine of other dogs. And he absolutely freaked out. 
just that, that vacuum, panic, desperate sniffing. He had actually, just minutes before, he had heard dogs barking, and in a, he absolutely panicked, became hysterical. He was a little baby puppy. He slipped his collar, started running to the highway. <sighs> I, luckily, he was a baby, so I caught him and got him and brought him back. We sat for 10 minutes. We both calmed down. I was like, <laughs> both calmed down. His collar on a lot tighter. <laughs> <laughs> really tight, um, took him back, put him down at the entrance of the vet clinic, and he would not leave. With huge dilated pupils, his eyes like this, just stiff. Finally picked him up, went inside. He saw the receptionist. He was like, oh, hi. Oh, it's a person. There are more of them. I love them. And we went in the vet. It was, oh, it's another person. I love people. That's so cool. We came out. There was a Bichon Frise puppy in the middle of the lobby, a Bichon Frise puppy. All right? We're talking like an ice cream cone dog. Right? Willie absolutely panics, runs and hides behind the chair. So that was his start, along with projectile diarrhea, the worst sound sensitivity I've ever seen, ever, ever, ever seen in a dog. I literally named him, it was, his name was Will, it changed to Willie because it was will he or won't he be alive when he's one. So this is Willie a couple of years ago. So what I was thinking about was with Willie, food was not an appropriate reinforcement. I used it in the beginning and he would take it and he would snatch it from my hand. And he did not come down, he did not get better. He would see a dog, he would look at me, and then he'd look at the dog. Look at me, look at the dog. It, just, it was not like getting us anywhere. I mean, he wasn't barking and lunging, so it was getting us somewhere. I, well, yeah, he, it was getting us somewhere. And that he would, he would not bark and lunge, but he was still really tense. It was nowhere near far enough. Um, I took out his tug toy, which he loves. Remember dispersing tension? This is the dog who barked and lunged at the sheep and loved that feeling of, oh, I feel better now. So I changed it to a tug game. So he's about to, um, this is quite a while ago, he's about to meet a dog he'd never met before. Size matters to Willie. It's a Great Pyrenees um, uh, female. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what? Yes, good boy. Good, good boy. Good boy. Watch. Good boy. And you get to tug, and you get to play. And so the next phase of this particular training at that point in his career was Willie is inside this area I call the playpen. It's about a quarter of an acre, all fenced. Um, and they're going to greet at the gate. And this is, this is good and this is not good. What kind of a confrontation is this? Not ideal, right? Not at all ideal. On the other hand, it's also a great way just to give yourself an evaluation of how dogs are doing. So you can watch and see that part of the time it was okay, but when it was not okay, you'll see that it got handled so that it didn't turn into a problem. Excellent. Good boy. Good boy, Will. She turned away when we got loose again. See it? So we had her move away as soon as he got loose. Yeah, there's another little hello. Watch him go still. And I just said, get back. He looked a little nervous there. See, he was a little nervous. So I said, get back. So that was an on cue behavior I could use to help him stay out of trouble. And so what we did next is, um, and see now, oh, good boy. So he sniffed her and then he did an auto walk. So now we're in the area. He is up in the middle, off leash. She is coming up into this area. She's come through the gate. Gate is now shut. Um, and she is about to be let off leash. And I'm using a toy as a social bridge. And I will talk about the benefits and the problems with that a little bit later. And so, see the auto watches? See him pilo erect? That's a good boy. Oh, good girl. Very appropriate. But see, he's still aroused, but she, very appropriate. She has no interest in greeting him, which was like. That's fine. That's totally fine. The owner just said, she'll ignore him. I said, that's fine. That's probably best. <laughs> that's good. Okay. So 
let's just stop there. I'm just going to close this off because what we're going to do now is we're going to bring out a demo dog and we're going to work on this a little bit. So let's have Grendel come up. Grendel's going to come up and we will um, first talk a little bit about what's going on with Grendel and then we'll have a, a trigger dog, a stimulus dog, also known as bait, um, come up and we'll just work with the two of them. One thing I should say while Grendel's coming up that's really important is that in seminars, all of us are trying to illustrate a particular method. And it, particularly this morning, my goal, is just wait, just right there for one second, is my goal is to illustrate different methods. But I need to tell you, I've never met these dogs before. I met them briefly earlier. They came up on the stage, so I've met them for like 120 seconds. So I might, I might start working with one of these dogs and go like, okay, well, this is not the right method for this dog. So we might go out of order, but it's got to be driven by the dog. It's got to be driven by the dog. It's a wonderful phrase that, that Trish King uses, Grisha used it yesterday, honor the dog. I love that phrase. It's really got to be all about the dog. So let's bring up, this is Grendel. You have a mic? Oh, Dennis, she needs a mic. Hi, sweetie. Great, thanks. So, hi. Hello. Hi. If you would just be so kind, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, how old, <laughs> Grendel, and just tell us about the problem. Okay. Um, my name is Anne, and this is Grendel. He's a German short hair pointer rescue. And I've had him since he was about three and a half months old. The first day I brought him home, he met another puppy about his same age and growled. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> haven't seen that before. But he has uh, been going to daycare five Seems days a so. week um, since he was a puppy. He's fine with other dogs off leash. He's not particularly playful with them. He, he kind of has his own agenda and he's looking for squirrels and birds and butterflies. Um, but he's friendly with other dogs when he's off leash. Um, when he's on leash, he's friendly maybe 10% of the time, okay. and the rest of the time he is reactive when he sees another and, and dog. And what, what is his version? What's the, what's the 10? Uh, what's the worst he's done? The worst is just um, lunging and literally spinning like a helicopter at the end of the leash. That's fun for you, oh, right? Yeah. So it's not, not, <laughs> so not so good for my shoulder. Barking? And barking. Barking and lunging, yeah. barar, so classic barky bark lunger boy. And he's more right. likely to do it if he's already amped up about sure. something. So when sure. I, you guys know Green Lake, right? So, you know, there's so many squirrels there that he's just in a state of high arousal when he's sure. there. So when he sees other dogs, he just reacts really strongly there. And arousal is so important, you know, and the more triggers you have to create an increase in arousal, the easier it is to stimulate behavior, right? So what we're going to do, hi, sweetie, <laughs> hey, honey. Actually, is it okay? I'm going to work with him sure. a little bit. And um, I'm just going to teach him watch. Um, and, and he has a little start on that, but, but not with me and, and, and not too far. So I'm just going to show you how I teach watch. Obviously, this is not ideal, right? This is not ideal because didn't I say the progression is you teach watch in an area with no distractions? <laughs> it's like dog training class, isn't it? <laughs> dog training class is the worst place to teach novice owners and novice dogs how to do things. But we muddle through. So, so we're going to go way too far too fast. Yes, we are. And I know that Grendel loves food. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So I have to wait. Watch. Good boy. Good boy. Um, I should mention here that I'm actually training myself to do something that I'm not trained on yet is, is I, I more and more and more, um, I really like using a marker and praise. I use a marker as a marker, right? Uh, a clicker, often. I want to I wanna work without clickers today, partly because I have a lot of clients who just do not want something else. They're so overwhelmed. So clickers are incredibly valuable things, incredibly valuable. But it's also nice to be able to work without them. But the concept of a marker is incredibly important. I used to say yes. Once I started using markers, and then I'd use praise also as a secondary reinforcer. But once I started using markers, I would say yes for my verbal marker if I didn't have a clicker. I'm not crazy about yes. It works really well, but it's not precise. Sit. He says, stop talking. 
and work with me. Sit. Get back. Oh, go forward. But I wanted something that's more precise, because what works so great about the clicker is that it's really precise. There are a lot of things about it. So I was trying to figure out what to do. I'm trained to say yes. That's what I tend to say. I'm trying to teach myself to say click. <laughs> I talked about it on my blog. It's like, what could I do? What could I do besides yes? What could I do? What could I do? And somebody wrote in my blog and said, I just say click. And I was like, duh. <laughs> pa duh. <laughs> because click is a sound. It's onomatopoetic. It's somewhat like the sound of a click, right? And that's a very useful sound to getting a dog's attention. So I'm training myself to do it, but I'm not 100%. So you're going to hear click and yes. If you could give me chocolate whenever I click, I would be very grateful. Hi, sweetie. Watch. Click. Good boy. Very nice. Nice. Watch. Click. Good boy. Oh, aren't you good? Oh, you're a very clever boy. Watch, click, good boy. Oh, I'm chocolate, please. I would like some chocolate. Aren't you clever? Oh, you're very clever. Watch, click, good boy. Couple of things. One, if you stare at your dog, especially if you have food, they will stare at you. And that's one of the problems that people run into when they're doing this work and they're using food. They're like, they stare at the dog. Oh, very nicely done. The dog stares at them. You have got to take your, you want to have the dog's, you know, you want to be able to see your dog, but not be making constant eye contact with them. Watch, click, good boy. Now, did you notice that he turned his head away from what he was looking at, but he didn't look at my face. I used to, it was watch like this. It was like, look at my eyes, look right at my eyes. And, and when I started, I would hold the food right up here. Watch. Yes, click, good boy, and give him food. And over time, I just, I've, I've gotten much more accepting of just a head turn, because that's what I want. That's what I want. That's one of those universal features of all the methods we're going to use, avoiding the confrontation, and I also, over time, and this is really interesting when we talk about bat training, those of you who were here yesterday, just inadvertently, without even consciously doing it, I change from watch, yes, good boy, to, I'm waiting, watch, click, good boy. What did I do? I backed away, right? I started backing away a little bit. I think it's very reinforcing for a dog to follow you. It also increases the distance between you and the other dog. Watch. Click. Good boy. Very nice. Yes, you're a very good boy. Let's just walk around a little bit. Oh, it's slippery, honey. We won't go too fast then. You're a very nice dog. I think you're a very fun dog. I like the boy. I'm just doing a little, it's me and him, we've got a sort of the friends here. Yeah. Do you want to go, want to go back to Anne for a minute? Okay. So we're going to have him leave, and then we're going to bring up, let's bring up Kai. Yay! <laughs> we're going to bring up a tiny little dog that you can barely notice, um, <laughs> who's, who's a perfect stimulus dog, trigger dog, in that this is a non-reactive dog. He's a little hard to miss. Um, he's a non-reactive dog. And if we're going to try it, this may be too far. We're going to try, hi, honey. I know. I don't call this an oven dog. I got a head like an oven. And when I open my mouth, I just want to put my paw right in there. It's just like, oh, there's a big cherry paw for you. Or you're going to talk like this when you talk to a master. Sort of like Robin Williams. OK. Sweetie. So if you would do what, if you would just stay still, keep him turned toward you, would be even better. So we're decreasing the intensity. We're a little closer than I would like to be, but this way you can see better. So we're going to try it at this distance with him turned the other way. So let's bring Grendel up, and I'm going to be the handler for a little bit. Hi, honey. Because Anne's very sweet about it. Well, what was that? Well, I don't know that he saw the dog, but I thought maybe he did, so I reinforced him. Hi. Watch. Boy, I forgot the click, but I gave him the treat. Very nice. Watch. Click. Good boy. That's nice. 
I, I had asked Dan, or Ann what his distance is, and, and understandably, the answer to every question, if it's accurate, is it depends. Watch. Good. Click. Good. Boy. So, so it varies. Is this a distance at which he might react? Yeah, if he's already wound up. If he's already wound up. Okay. And so one of my goals in this, I talked about thresholds. I am a big, big, big advocate of working under threshold. So you figure out what a dog's threshold is and you work underneath it and then you gradually work your way up. You work up to push the envelope. You get closer and closer and closer once the dog has a different behavioral pattern established. So, so you, we are working under threshold. So one of the problems with that with clients is that people will say, it drives them crazy. They'll say, but he's fine, but he's fine here. And the answer is, I know. That's why we're working here. And so, and, but it's important to become very articulate about explaining why, because we want to set up a win. We want to teach him a behavioral response when he can do it. You don't want to practice something difficult in front of a bunch of people at, at Madison Square Garden, right? You want to practice in the privacy of your own home. So we're creating a practice event for him like kids would practice on the field behind their high school before they go to the state finals, right? So use some kind of a human analogy because it's really hard for people to get because they, 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 want, they want their dog to blow up so you believe them. So those of you who are trainers, it's really important to get that good boy, that people often are not believed. They're not believed by their friends. They're not believed by their husband. They're not believed by their vet. Oh, but look, he's being so good. So that's a huge issue. Hi, sweetie. Hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> Watch, click. Good boy, very nice. Watch, click, good boy. That was almost an auto watch. Yeah. So I'm only going to say watch when he looks at the dog. Watch, click, good boy. So these auto watches, you need to be primed to look for them because they can happen in the first session. Was that one? I'm not sure. Good boy, good boy. If you're not sure, then you're better off saying, sure it was. <laughs> yeah, good boy. Although it depends on the dog, you know, it's, it's again, it, it depends. Hi, mister. Yes, that's awesome. Click. Oh, what a good boy. That was another watch. Did you see it? Oh, Grendel, you are the smartest dog that ever lived. Look what you got. You get everything. You get this, and you get this, and you get cheese, and you get turkey from my, my sandwich last night, and there's cheese, and there's turkey. Oh, and that's something. I don't even know what that is, but it's brown, and it looks really good. Oh, my goodness gracious. Wow, that was fun. Wow. Good boy. Good boy. That was fun. That was fun. That was nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to Oh, good boy, good boy. All right, so um, it's always hard to work a dog and talk at the same time because you start missing everything, right? So what we're going to do is, is things are going so well, and we're in a seminar, so I'm going to push the envelope a little bit. This would be a fine ending of a session. This would be a fine ending of a session. I'm going to take it a little farther because it's a seminar. But I want to tell you, if you're working your dog or you're working a client's dog, and the question comes up in your head, should I stop now? The answer is you probably should have a few trials before. <laughs> if you're like me, maybe you're different. Um, you always want to try and end while you're ahead because if we have a bark and a lunge, then what do we do? We can't end there, right? Um, because they get reinforced, as we said, two ways when they bark and they lunge. Hi, mister, you're a very good fun boy. Oh, very fun to work with. But it's a seminar, so let's up the ante a little bit. So we are at the lowest possible intensity. That dog is barely moving. <laughs> He's turned away. I have like the best food in the world, and I have a food hound. So, and we're the ones doing the approach. It's much harder for click, 
good boy. It's much harder for the subject dog, I'm gonna call him, for Grendel, to have a dog come towards him, which is what happens in real life, right? So, so we're gonna just do a little bit of that. We're gonna stand over here. Hi, oh, that's a very good boy. And what, what I'm gonna ask you to do with Kai is just, um, let's just try it with you walking in a circle. Don't come any closer, but now we're gonna add movement in because movement is a big trigger. Click, good boy. Click, good boy, very nice. <gasps> very nice. Click, good boy, very good. Click, oh, did you hear that little hoof? Good boy, so what does that little hoof tell you? Arousal? Yeah, so we're getting to be on a boundary, right? We're getting to be right at the edge of what I would consider to be the threshold. Hi, honey. How are you doing? Click. Good boy. Yeah, that's, see how different he is? He just huffed again. I don't know if you can hear him, but he just huffed again. Click. Good boy. Okay, would you stop for a second? Click. Oh, wow. One of the things about this is, again, think about arousal level. Click, good boy. So just that movement, and I was moving, and he was starting to spiral up with his arousal. So, so give him a chance to recover. This is a good time to just stop. Let him sniff. See, he's sniffing now. It's a great thing for him to be doing. This is not random. Yeah, he's looking for food. But here's the food, right? He could be looking here, too. Hi. Click, that was really good. Oh, you are so clever. Oh, very click, good boy. Very good. So one of the things with him, do you see how I've changed my demeanor a little bit? Is I'm click, good boy. Very nice, good. You are so clever. You're really fun. You're a well good boy. <coughs> ah, I know. Click. Very good. All right. So that's a good ending of a session. Right? Makes sense? Oh. Wee. Wee. Okay. Good boy. All right. You can take Kai off. Thank you, Kai. Thank you. We will probably have Brenda come back up. But, um, but I wanted to, to take some questions before we break, and I think actually, shockingly, please record this. I'm glad this is being taped because this may be the only time this ever happens. Um, let's take some questions and then we'll take a break. Yes, and I'm, before you speak, I need to get a microphone to you so everybody can hear you. So um, here comes George now. I was just wondering how old Grindel is and how long he's been practicing this behavior. Uh, he, how old is Grendel? He's eight, and, and you said he'd done a little bit of, you don't call, you call it watch me? And what level of ability on watch me would you say he is in terms of like 10 being like he'll do it no matter what's happening, there's a dog in his face, or five people are at the door, zero is he has no clue what it means whatsoever. I would say five. About a five? Zero if there's somebody at the door. Zero if there's somebody at the door. Yeah. So he had learned it some. When I asked her, it's a really good question. When I asked her, she said, "Yeah, he's he, he's. I think you said something like, yeah, he sort of knows it." So, so when I asked him to do it up here, he did not know it with me, understandably, right? So, so this went. It's a really good question because this went a little faster than it's going to, uh, in a lot of cases. The next dog we're going to work after break does not know it very highly aroused dog and I'm going to have the owner work the dog so it's going to look very different probably um, but one of the things I love about watch is that it seems to be with my clients they love teaching it there's all kinds of stuff they don't want to do they really like teaching it and it's a natural behavior for a dog it's really easy for them to do yes they have to learn timing yes they do and that's the hardest part is you have to learn them as soon as that dog heads head turns, they have to say, they have to mark it, um, and then they have to reinforce it. And so as, as with everything that we're going to talk about, marking is really important. 
So yes, um, the microphone will come to the man with the red jacket on. Oh, I'm sorry, it will not come to the man with the red jacket on. Please do not express your frustration by barking or lunging. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, my question is, uh, how, how many times can you use the stuffed dog before we get a dog who's just like, oh, it's, it's not a real dog? Oh, it's a great question. How many times can you use a stuffed dog before a dog habituates to it? Sometimes once. Literally, sometimes once, with some dogs, if you have it in different context and the dog never gets up to sniff it, you can use it 20 times. So it, it, it depends. <laughs> My answer to everything is it depends. Um, and it partly depends on if they get to sniff it or not. Okay. Uh, yes, the patient man with a red jacket. Okay, so um, given it depends on the dog. I know in psychology when they treat post-traumatic stress syndrome, they use two forms of counter conditioning. The one that takes a little bit longer and there's one where they speed up the process and they put a little bit higher of a level of stimulus and maybe press the boundaries a little bit farther. So is that des desensitizing? Yeah. So like if you're noise sensitive, they'll start with a really... Yeah, noise sensitive, dogs reactive, things like that. Right. You know, they see it, they react. Right. Um, when would you press the boundary a little bit to cause growth? You know, because there's, there's the point at which where they're doing the look at me, look at me, and it's pretty easy, but right. you have to press the boundary, cause a little bit of stress to cause growth. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, a, that's another great question because you do have to push the boundaries or else you never get anywhere, right? So here's my criteria for pushing the boundary. After I answer it, it depends. <laughs> um, uh, one is when, when you have a dog who is, it's, this is the standard answer, and, but it serves me well, so, so I'm gonna repeat it. When you have a dog who's 85, say 90% reliable in that context on a particular cue, then you start making the difficulty level uh, a little bit higher. So what, what's, what's tricky here is that there's so many different contexts that change the difficulty level. So here, even though this is a very distracting environment, this was a, this was a, this was a great demo for a, for a start because he's really food motivated, we had total control of that other dog. Take, take the dog outside and have him by surprise um, run into another one of these dogs and you've just pushed him over his boundary of working. So what, what, what you want to do, like what we did with Oscar, is you gradually figure out what the triggers are and then gradually set up situations in which you get them a little closer or get that dog coming a little faster or have them be a little surprised by a dog coming around a corner. So you need to know the triggers, you need to know the threshold, and then you set up situations where each time you go a little further. Like here, we had the stimulus dog not moving, and then we had the stimulus dog moving. So the next session, I might start with a stimulus dog not moving for one trial, maybe two, and then I would push right away to the stimulus dog moving, but I might back the distance up because he was starting to huff already. Um, so, does that help? How about one more question, and then we will. I have a take microphone. Break. Does that mean I win? <laughs> this is like <laughs> this is like the peace pipe. <laughs> she I would, who has microphone has the power. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't it. let it go. I'm just so excited to know um, your answer to yes. the food toy question yeah. and how arousal plays into that um, because I view a toy reward as hot, more arousing and I would really like to know uh, just your thoughts on that. Oh, it's a great, it's such a good question, you guys. That's a really good question. So here's, here's part of my criteria. You saw me use a tug toy with Willie. He loves to play tug and Willie needs his tension dispersed. So Willie is a dog who who when he saw, at one point when he was young, um, I won't bore you with all the details, but one time another dog did jump on him and all the work we'd done just, you can imagine, we just smashed back to him attacking two other dogs basically when he was about eight months old. Um, so we had to go way backwards. But So he is a dog who, who just tenser and tenser and tenser and tenser and, if you, and, and loves the release. So when I was like, oh, good boy, good boy, good boy, it actually calmed him down. There are other dogs, Yogi, the dog who's gonna come up, who got really aroused when I took him. He was very uncomfortable with it and he started biting at the leash and jumping up and looking very, very highly aroused as people were getting dilated. 
Um, that is a dog, in that situation, the last thing I would do is pump up his arousal level. Does that, does that help? All right, let's, let's take, before you get up, let's decide when we're gonna come back. So, all right, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna, again, do an operant conditioning procedure. We're gonna use positive reinforcement, and again, we're gonna have a behavior on cue. This behavior is the opposite, superficially, of auto watch. Because this behavior is look at the dog on cue. I just call it, where's the dog? Um, Control and Leash talks about this method. I used it with Willie. I'll just tell you my progression, which is I, for, Willie was so bad when he'd see, when he'd smell the urine of another dog, he would react. So I started by teaching him, and he was just, he lost in it. He was just lost in it. So I started teaching him a watch in that context, turned it into an auto watch when he saw other dogs, but I found it really useful also uh, once I got him to the point where I could, he was manageable in terms of his own arousal level, um, I found it really useful to be able to ask him to look at the other dog. And I've used that with a lot of clients' dogs. You know those dogs who are so, who, who, who the clients say, or maybe it's your own dog, it's like he doesn't see the dog yet. He doesn't see the dog, the dog's like right there, right? And the subject dog is sniffing and looking everywhere but right there. It's like, oh yeah, he knows the dog is there. There's some dogs that are so uncomfortable at another dog that they will not look at them. And that's another case where where's the dog is really helpful. So you just simply ask the dog, look at the other dog on cue. Um, I mentioned here, it's the same kind of um, increasing intensity that you would use with, uh, with the other. One of the tricks with it is, it's sort of like classic conditioning, is you have to be really careful the dog knows it's the dog. So you can say, what's that, or where's the dog? And um, you don't really know necessarily that it's actually the dog that, that the subject dog is, is associating with, uh, with the eventual reinforcement. So, so you need to vary the context a lot so that the only thing that's always the same is there's a dog there. So you have a dog with a human, you have a dog with a handler, you have a dog behind a fence. Just make sure the only thing that stays the same is that it's a dog. Um, same kind of, of pushing the boundaries as we were talking about earlier is that you gradually increase the intensity of the trigger. Very careful to think about the characteristics of the, of the stimulus dog. Breed matters, size matters, movement matters, distance matters, everything matters. And um, one of the one of the last things I wanted to say about this that I cannot illustrate here because I just can't get one of the dogs to pee up here. The, I asked the hotel, but you know, they said no, I don't know why. Um, no, I didn't. But one of the things I just did with my last client last week is we were introducing a puppy, a female absolutely full of herself, nine week old Siberian Husky female who growled at Willie over a stick on the ground, all right? So Willie's going, oh look, hi, 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 it's a little puppy, isn't she cute? She's so cute. And the puppy goes, oh. <laughs> so she's nine weeks old. She is being introduced to an eight-year-old female husky who has lived by, who's not only lived by herself on a vegetable farm, she has been a deer guard dog and a, a protection dog her job is to keep other animals from coming into the property, right? She, has, she had a dog who worked with her and then he died. She has one good dog friend, a goofy male Labrador who wanders from a neighbor. She's inside an electric fence so she can't get out, other animals can get in. She's not allowed, she's not supposed to let any other animals in except squirrels and um, that's about it. She has reacted to other dogs on occasion if they were small uh, and outside and moving by picking them up and shaking them. So, so my job was to help my friends introduce these two dogs and have them be friends for the rest of their life. You know, and, and those of you who are trainers, I was like, why is it always your friends? You know? <laughs> or your mother, you know, right? It's always the really hard ones. It's like, oh. So, um, so one of the things we did is I asked the puppy owners to have their puppy urinate 
to basically gather a bunch of urine as best they could. So she couldn't get a bowl of it, but she brought a towel that, was, that somehow, for some reason, was saturated in urine. And so I used that. That was the way the dog's first, that was the older dog's first introduction. That is how dogs normally often greet each other. Annika Lisberg did her PhD in Wisconsin on, on overmarking, on, ur on urination behavior, which no one has ever studied, by the way. We don't even know why dogs mark. We think they're marking territory. We don't actually even know that. We really don't. And she was particularly interested in overmarking. You know, one dog comes to the area where another dog has urinated and urinates right on top of it or right close to it. She was particularly interested in that. She also watched dogs enter dog parks to look at urination behavior. And one of the things she discovered was that urination is a kind of a cutoff signal, or at least that's how she interpreted it. You know the dog park scenario. The dog comes to the gate, gets swamped. Incredibly atypical, uncomfortable position for the entering dog to be in. What she found was dogs appeared to be, often dogs, for some reason, would be tense by being surrounded by 10 other dogs. Um, and they would stand there and then move away, 10 feet away, and urinate. And then leave, and all the dogs would come over and sniff the urine. This is a great way to, it's like reading the blog of somebody before you meet them, you know? It's like, it, it, it's like the personal ads, you know? You listen to their voice first. And um, so it's a wonderful way, just, to, just parenthetically, and you can use it with any of these methods, it's a wonderful way to help introduce dogs. Just let urine be the, the bridge. Well, we're not going to do that here. Oh, we are definitely not going to do that here. Um, this is a quick video, and then we're going to have, just so you know, we're going to have Yogi come up in a little bit, not quite yet. And then I'm going to ask Kai to come up again, actually, with Yogi, I think is a good idea. So this is just, um, this is a video that I actually did three days ago. And I was trying to illustrate, and you might see it, the difference between using food as a reinforcement with some dogs versus a toy as a reinforcement. You can see a little bit of a difference with Willie. Uh, I'm not sure how extreme it is because now he's four and he's doing so well. There is a Dogo Argentino behind the fence. And size matters very, very much to Willie. Very, very, very much. What? Auto watch, oh boy. There's food. See him snatch at it a little bit? Even yeah. now. There's an auto watch girl. Boy, but you missed it. Good boy. That was a little more relaxed taking of the food. And now I'm going to ask him, where's the dog? Stop. That was, that was stop to um, the photographer, not Willie. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Where's the dog? <laughs> See how loose he was? Where's the dog? <laughs> Where's the dog? <laughs> good boy. Oh, very good. Oh, very good. Oh, I love the boy dog. Where's the dog? So, so I missed what happened in between because we stopped taping. We talked a little bit. They actually had a slightly uncomfortable, slightly tense greeting at the fence. And then the dogo started moving back and forth. Um, Willie became completely and totally relaxed, so we let them in together. And this is what happened. Okay. It's my new girlfriend! Look how fast she is! I love her! I love to run, I love to run, I love to run, I love to run! Okay. I want to I use this to illustrate the concept of using a toy as a social bridge. It's both a benefit and it can be a disadvantage as well. In Willie's case, it's very, very beneficial. He loves his toys. A toy gave him something else to focus on um, and made it easier for him then to start a relationship with another dog. 
However, the downside is, and Grisha talked about this yesterday in bad training, the downside is if they're too focused on the toy, they can end up never being focused on the other dog. So it's fine as a bridge, but, but it has to lead to a relationship between the other dogs. You will see in this case, in this case, it does not lead to a relationship between these two dogs, but using a toy as a bridge is what gave Willie, the, and a lot of my client dogs, the ability to start, to be comfortable enough to start working with other dogs. This is a dog named Delta. She looks like a, um, well, it doesn't matter what she is. See how he's piloed? See how he's uncomfortable? Pilo erection is a sign of arousal. It is not offense or defense, it's arousal. He's sniffing. Again, that like, we don't have to greet. Look, I don't want to hug everybody. Most people, but not everybody. You still, you see his hair is still up a little, it's still up. Look, they're playing tug and it's still up a little bit. He's still a bit aroused. He's not completely comfortable with her. But this is giving him the ability to be in a pen with another dog. This is, he attacked two dogs very seriously when he was a younger dog. That is not an about to attack. Um, that I, at least I don't think so. I think that was a tentative like, did you want to interact more with this toy with me or not? But we're just guessing, right? We don't know what's going on inside in their head. I just wanted, this, this last interaction is like, um, uh, it's like mirror greeting. Watch these two dogs. I'll greet you, you greet me. <laughs> and she leaves to go sniff. He says hello to her. Hello, <sighs> Okay. Oh, okay. Nice, big, happy face. Nice, relaxed dog. Very nice ending um, to that particular session.